from the New Arts and Media Studios in Milwaukee. I'm Charles Purcell. This is The Log. You know how I'm always, uh, at least at least once per episode, more than that, I talk about abolishing either profit or borders or both. And I do mean that quite literally. Uh, I think sometimes I need to be a little more specific. Yeah, abolish profit, which which really means... Yeah, abolish profit. And one example of that would be nationalizing the internet. And I want to recommend a book called Platform Socialism, How to Reclaim Our Digital Future from Big Tech by author James Muldoon. There's a nice write-up in a recent uh, Jacobin article. And he makes the case uh, a lot better than I can. I keep trying to make the case, but I don't know if I'm having success here. This guy's uh, pretty smart. Looks like he's written a pretty decent book. I like this interview. He makes the argument I've tried to make that uh, the social media could be fantastic, right? Imagine a world without social media. We don't really want that. We don't want to go back to that. And all the problems of social media are a result of the profit motive. Take that away, the problems go away. As he points out, services like I'm reading from the article now. There's a strong argument that certain digital services like a search engine or social network are now essential for living in most societies. Yeah, I think it's really hard to argue with that. Liberal reformers have made the case that because these companies operate in marketplaces with tendencies toward natural monopolies, we should extend the idea of public utilities from infrastructure to software in order to redress power imbalances arising from private control of these services. Yeah, it's pretty simple, actually. Yeah, this is it. Because these uh, these platforms are really useful. <laughs> They're, they really can provide a great service. He says this, We need to liberate technology from capitalism and show that platforms and other digital services can be an important part of our emancipatory future. Now, if you're worried about this new nationalized platform being some sort of uh, inefficient bureaucracy, well, here's how he answers that, quoting from the article he's interviewed by Jacobin. We should look to the function the platform performs and its community of users to determine the best path forward for how users can be given ownership and governance over the platform. See, this is what I'm always talking about. I'm always talking about small d democracy. Whatever the entity is, if it's a workplace, if it's a housing development, if it's a digital platform, the people make the rules. Small d democracy. No need to have a big hierarchy. No need for this sort of uh, ridiculous idea of top-down leadership. Trickle-down democracy is as ridiculous as trickle-down economics. No, 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 no. We don't want either one of them. Continuing to read here from the uh, interview. There is a genuine desire for people to have more of a say in how online services and communities function. The democratic alternatives I mention in the book are generally prototypes and models where communities have more participatory rights in determining the rules of the game. It's not just about national public funding. Communities should be able to participate in some forms of decision-making and play a role in agenda setting for the organization. There is always going to be some element of democratic leadership, but ordinary users need to be empowered to have their voices heard on issues where it counts. So I'm I'm all about this. And that statement could be applied to any number of social activities. With sufficient public funding, he says, we could offer a search engine that was free to use and didn't involve a surveillance and advertising business integrated into the software. Yeah, all of that is unnecessary. We can have all the good and none of the bad. All of the advertising, all of the surveillance, all of the data mining. It doesn't need to be part of the equation. Those are all just revenue streams. And sure, you say, well, they pay for the service. Well... (laughs) How much does it cost? 
How much does it cost us? <laughs> I mean, you know we pay for everything, right? Nothing's free. That's not how business models work. <laughs> if, if you think anything out there is free, you're, you're just kidding yourself. We pay for everything. So as long as we're paying for it, why don't we pay for it through a public mechanism? This is exactly analogous to the healthcare system. Universal health care, completely public, paid through our taxes, would cost less, far, far less than our current system. And it would be free. But I just said, well, nothing's free. Right. Well, okay, it's paid through our taxes. But those taxes we pay for 99% of us would be far, far less than the health care system is costing us now. This is all down in black and white. You don't have to make up these figures. So, no, nothing is free. But public funding of health care, the proposed public funding here of the digital world, would cost far, far less. And in the bargain, no more surveillance and no more advertising, conspiracy theories, and no more preying on vulnerable targets. You know, we heard so much about Instagram and its impact on young girls and teen suicide. All of that driven by profit. Take away the profit, take away the problems. Will some problems still linger? Yeah, I'm sure there will be. Will, will there be unintended consequences? Yeah, by very definition, an unintended consequence is, is unintended. It's unanticipated. So, sure, maybe. I don't know. Let's, let's find out. If you can uh, foresee any big problems, you know, let me know. And we'll, we'll uh, factor that into the plan. Anyway, since I talk about it all the time, I just thought I'd recommend this to you. Once again, the author is James Muldoon, and the book is Platform Socialism, How to Reclaim Our Digital Future from Big Tech. Yeah, I do talk about abolishing profit all the time. And I, I really do mean it very literally. It's not just some joke or some utopian dream. No, just we just need to do it. I mean, look at the, um, look at the whole landscape of your media choices. From all the cable channels to all the streaming services, uh, there are just I don't know, I don't know what the total count is. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of options you have. Uh, among those options, you can find almost anything, right? Twenty four hours a day of news, twenty four seven three sixty five, right? Uh, the Golf Channel. You can find golf. You can find football. Any any one of Many, many sports and uh, interests. And you can find comedy here and news over there. And you can find your porn over there. And just whatever you're into. Now, let's, let's go back and look at this landscape again. Is there, um, is there a 24-7, 365 platform dedicated to the climate crisis? Uh, if there is, please let me know. Because I, I, I haven't seen one. How about, um, you know, every year we have Black History Month. You know, wouldn't that be kind of nice to have a platform dedicated to Black History? Just any time of year, any month of the year, not just February. 24-7, 365, why not? They have 24-7, 365 on uh, fishing. And sure, a lot of people like fishing. But <laughs> why in the world do we have multiple channels on fishing and zero dedicated to black history, and zero dedicated to the climate crisis, especially solutions to the climate crisis. Do you think people would be interested? I don't know how many people are interested in fly fishing, enough apparently to have a, a channel dedicated. Because even though we have all of these countless thousands of platforms and individual programs, we still have what you can call a mainstream media because it's still profit-driven, it's still hierarchical, and if whatever you're presenting either A, doesn't draw in enough viewers to make it profitable, or B, challenges the status quo to the extent that the status quo is endangered, either one of those <laughs> reasons, A or B, you're not going to find uh, any airtime, let alone get your own channel. 
So it's really quite easy to imagine a world where the media is nationalized and not in a heavy-handed, top-down, bureaucratic way. No. Nationalized, where the people involved in creating and viewing the content have a simple democratic relationship. Now, if you're a defender of the marketplace as it exists now, you say, well, if people really wanted the, um, the climate crisis channel, then there'd be a market for it. People would pay for it, and it would be there. Obviously, people don't want the climate crisis channel. No, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, how many channels do you go scrolling by before you find one, the one you want? There are all sorts of things out there that we don't want. And to repeat what I said earlier, nothing's free. We're paying for it all. We're paying for everything. Sometimes it's direct and sometimes it's indirect. We have direct uh, subscription fees, but then advertising is an indirect cost because obviously <laughs> that cost is reflected in the price of the product. And even though I'm not a beer drinker, so I'm not impacted by the cost of the beer commercials, overall, system-wide, I and you and everyone else, we are paying. We all pay. Nothing's free. So nationalized media allow freedom from content creators and from content viewers to decide together what they want. There's still very much a free market of ideas. Yeah, let's see if the Climate Crisis Channel doesn't have some viewers. I've, uh, I've talked at length before. I think this is a good comparison. Imagine, if you would, <laughs> uh, Joe Biden and the Orange Menace standing up in front of the nation in a televised debate, which, by the way, we'll probably never see again. <laughs> anyway, but... Anyway, it doesn't ruin my little uh, analogy here. Okay, imagine the two of them standing on a on a stage. And there's Judy Woodruff or somebody moderating. And it's a national audience. Now, put right in the middle of that stage, right between the two, an independent candidate, an alternate voice other than Republican and Democrat. An alternate voice that's not a corporate party, as the Democrats and Republicans both are. Democrats and Republicans are very different in many ways, but they are both corporate parties. Imagine an anti-corporate party right in the middle. I think it would just, it would blow voters away. Like, oh, yeah, okay. guess I didn't really think of that. I think if it was a 50-50 race before that debate, after the debate, if people actually understood, oh, we have an option? I didn't realize we had an option. Okay. They realized we have an option. I think the numbers afterwards would come out, I don't know, 60-20-20 in favor of the independent. If you give people a choice, I'd love to see how many people grab onto that choice. You know, having a, a climate crisis channel, and I, could, I should think of some other examples, but let's just stay with that for now. Having a climate channel detailing the horrors of what's in front of us, as well as detailing the solutions before us, that's not a force-feeding broccoli onto our plate. No, I think, that's, I think that's giving us something that maybe we don't realize we need. Because look at what the profit system gives us. And uh, as much as we want to... <laughs> as much as we want to uh, flatter ourselves... And think we've got this really great diverse system. You know, again, mainstream media still rules as much as we want to pretend that's not the case. And what does mainstream media give us? It gives us Tucker Carlson. It gives us the masked singer. It gives us the bachelor. It gives us true crime. My God, the garbage that the profit system spews out. In a non-profit, publicly owned media landscape, I don't know exactly what it would look like, but I, I don't know. I'd like to find out. I think the trash would be sent to the curb. I just, you know, call me optimistic. I'll confess. In a media landscape where everybody's got the same shot, just like that presidential debate where everybody's got the same shot, 
I guess I have to confess in still having some faith in uh, in the public. <laughs> it gets harder and harder every day. But I think I still do have some faith in us. I don't know. People like to think we have a meritocracy. We don't have a meritocracy in almost any system in America. It's all manipulated by money and profit. The best doesn't rise. The best movie doesn't win the Oscar. The best team doesn't win the Super Bowl. Well, actually, let's not get into sports. Maybe that's the one place it it works the best. But even there, you know, major market cities have an advantage over small market cities, unless you really get in there like, well, like the NFL does pretty much. Uh, it works less well in baseball and basketball. But with revenue sharing, the NFL has, uh, for the most part, gotten rid of that problem. But let's not, let's not veer into other territory. But that really is actually not a bad example. Uh, there's an awful lot of control, and that is, that is a form of socialism. It's, it's revenue sharing among the cities so that one team or a, a handful of teams don't dominate year after year. And that's only because the league itself, I mean, each has its own owner, but they're part of this association where rules are made. So it's very much sort of a socialist uh, in that regard, a socialist endeavor. But uh, yeah, the idea that we're a meritocracy, just for the most part, just really isn't true. And there's absolutely room in the media landscape for content and issues that currently can't turn a profit. It doesn't make them any less important. It just means they can't turn a profit. I'm always recommending Democracy Now! Just a fantastic news program covering issues that just get completely ignored by the corporate media because they're, they're not local enough, they're not sexy enough, they're not dramatic or sensational, but they're important. And a certain amount of audience is drawn to Democracy Now!, but Democracy Now! is guilty of the two things I, st I said earlier. A, they're providing a product that can't compete profit-wise. And B, they're providing content that challenges the status quo. So they're never going to compete in a for-profit world. And to be relegated to that position of just oh, over here in its own little bubble and you people over there who like it, you know, there it is. It's there for you. That's, that's what the apologists will say. That's what the capitalists will say. Well, look, the system provides that for you, and you, you seem to like it. So what are you complaining about? Well, no, it has, it has this low rung on the ladder. And it's like that third candidate on the debate stage. It just doesn't have the exposure it deserves. I have, I have conservative family and friends who have no idea what's going on, even on NPR and PBS, which are corporate centrists, basically. They've been pretty much uh, hoodwinked and hypnotized and brainwashed by conservative media, especially the radio talkers who they hear all day in their trucks, and then at night they come home to Fox News. So everything else is just a lie, they're told. I don't, I don't have to tell you this. We've all heard this story. But have you? Heard, I've heard this firsthand. Have you experienced this in your circle of family and friends? I've heard it firsthand. Yeah, they're lying to you. None of it's true. A nonprofit media landscape would even the playing field and create a real meritocracy, one that we only dream about now. And alternative points of views would be more easily available. Education is, is another great example. Public education has been under attack. I mean, really under attack for the last 40 plus years. The whole drive for voucher systems and public funding for private schools, public schools themselves just literally being sabotaged. These people want public schools to fail because they can't make any money in a, in a public school. They want to steer everybody to private schools all the way down from pre-K and through the university level. 
profit has power. And so the constant attack on public schools and universities, the literal sabotage, the siphoning off of public funds funneled to private education. Well, anyway, there are many, many avenues here we could follow regarding profit. And, uh, and I should do that here in future programs, uh, get specific. Because I'm always, you know, you hear me say it on a daily basis, abolish profit. Well, what does that mean? And um, this, this conversation started with the uh, recommendation of this article in uh, Jacobin, an interview with author James Muldoon regarding socialism and uh, the digital platforms. So, uh, yeah, without following that temptation to think of other examples. Let's just leave it at that for today. And we'll, um, we'll have other opportunities, and I'll, I'll promise to be a little more specific in future conversations when I talk about abolishing profit. I won't just leave it as a shorthand. I'll uh, make sure to delineate what that means a little bit. Uh, here's a, a little story before we go. Headline, unfortunately, we are not living in a simulation. <laughs> I'm sure you've been hearing for years now that we probably live in some sort of computer simulation, right? Elon Musk is convinced of it. Even people like, uh, who's, the, who's the astrophysics guy? Um, oh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's pretty well convinced of it. But a piece in Current Affairs by Nathan J. Robinson takes the other side. A dangerous new religious belief offers grounds for giving up on the physical world and living 100% online. More and more people are apparently asking the question, how do we know we're not all living in a big computer simulation, like in the Matrix? It seems they're asking seriously. Scientific American has run articles on the idea that the world might be some kind of video game being played by someone outside the universe. Elon Musk evidently believes this idea wholeheartedly, saying there is almost no chance we are not living in a computer simulation. David Chalmers' new book, Reality Plus, Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy, gives the idea very thorough consideration. But Robinson here in this current affairs article writes, For the same reason I declined to spend more than a single semester debating the reality of my hands, referring to... Uh, the nature of reality that you have. You have these discussions in philosophy classes. I'm very familiar. I would rather not give this peculiar delusion the time of day, but at least one of the richest and most powerful men in the world, Musk, fully believes it. Neil deGrasse Tyson says he thinks the likelihood might be very high. Chalmers' new book might make some more converts. The Guardian calls it convincing. It worries me that anyone can believe something so silly, partly because I think, as a general matter, it is better not to be delusional, but also because this type of thinking can actually lead to conclusions that have dangerous real-world implications. So, so here's the other side to it, and I'm, I'm sure you must have heard these conversations, right? The dangerous moral implications, well, if we're just in a game, we can really do... <laughs> that takes morality out the window. We can do whatever we want. Uh, there's, and there's this, you know, sex with robots and what's ethical in, in the uh, virtual world. And here's where I get a little confused. If we are living in a virtual world, and our own virtual world, the one that we can dive into from this platform, it gets a little meta here, from our so-called reality, just let's assume for a minute that it is real, <laughs> even though it's not. We're just in a matrix, okay? But from whatever level we're on now, we're creating the next level, the, uh, you know, the Zuckerberg metaverse, and we're, we're in that world more and more. And the whole reason that people tend to think we're in a simulation is because our own simulations are becoming more and more realistic, so it's only natural to think that however many years down the road, whether it takes 50 or 100 or 200, at some point, the two levels, the so-called real world and the virtual world, will be indistinguishable. And if that's our inevitable future, then their reasoning is, well, we're probably already there. <laughs> I don't know. 
If I cut my finger, it bleeds. That's all I need to know. <laughs> if I yell at my child, she cries. That's really kind of all I need to know. I don't think I need to know any more than that. Because what this whole conversation is missing, and here's what it really comes down to for me. Let's assume for a minute that we are living in a simulation. Okay. If we are, we are well past the point where the creator of this simulation is creating anything. They've gone on to something else. If we are in a simulation, we are long past the point where our creator had anything to do with us. Artificial intelligence and machine learning have taken over long, long ago. We are on our own. We are the little bits that are learning. I would, I would go so far as, as to guess, this is my little hypothesis, that except for very, very early human history, like the very beginning, all of evolution has been about artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer learning. It hasn't been in the hands of some kid playing a game in another universe. If it was, maybe it was. But I think if, if there is such a kid out there, they planted the very, very early seeds. And since then, it's been all about us. He's out doing something else. I mean, this would explain our absolute tsunami of, of unintended consequences, of absurdity, of pain. You know, the, uh, the, the great philosophical religious question, if God exists, why does he allow all this pain and suffering? Well, it's because God or our creator or the kid playing a game, all, all the same thing here, hasn't had anything to do with us for 99.99% of our history. He just got us started. He just, he just combobulated the, the initial ones and zeros. And the rest of it has been chance, has been machine learning, has been artificial intelligence with nobody's hand involved. We've been on our own since all but the very, very beginning. So this is why I don't care if we're a simulation or not. It, it's completely irrelevant. I don't care. It doesn't matter. Either way, we're on our own. And we have to make this right. Because when I prick my finger, it bleeds. And if I holler at my child, she cries. And that's all you really need to know. So that's my answer to a very complicated <laughs> debate about whether or not we live in a simulation. It doesn't matter. And you might have a lot of fun talking about it. Okay, have your fun. But then uh, when you're finished with that, could you come back to the adults table? Because we have important things to decide. Okay? All right. Okay, um, I think that's it. Is that it? Yeah, I guess that's it. I love you. I'm Charles Purcell. <laughs>